Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistance. I'd like to thank everyone for tolerating the long delay since the previous video. This is one of two missions that I actually managed to complete back in September before I ran out of time to work on everything. So I hope to have the subsequent video after this done fairly soon so you guys can expect much more frequent updates over the winter season. I decided to turn this mission into a video first because of a discussion thread that went up on the KSP boards around November. This thread was asking whether it was possible or not to go all the way to Tylo and back on a single stage without refueling. During one of my early videos I had made a space plane that could fly all the way from Kerbin to the surface of Tylo and back using mining on the surface of Tylo to refuel itself. This mission proved to me that using existing engines and barring the use of a physics glitch or some kind of crack and drive, it isn't possible to go from Kerbin to Tylo and back without any refueling or staging. Short of something very outside of the box, it's just not mathematically possible with the stock parts in the game. So in a subsequent mission, I had made a small space plane that could fly to Tylo and back unrefueled with no mining and fully recover itself but it used a modular design where it would release cargo in low Kerbin orbit and then release a lander once in low Tylo orbit. And then the lander would reattach to the interplanetary stage, which would then go back in the plane and everything would land on the runway. This, however, can only carry one Kerbal. In this mission, we're going to do a similar design, but it's going to have 64 Kerbals. Despite the very strange wing and control surface design, the reason for which will be seen later, this flies relatively normally on the ascent. I use the typical ascent profile that I've been using for a lot of my planes, where I accelerate to around 400 meters per second before beginning to climb in earnest. One of the unusual things about this plane's design is that it incorporates both nuclear as well as ion engines to reach Kerbin's orbit. Generally, if you're just trying to reach low Kerbin orbit, it's not worth using the ion engines because their TWR is just too low. However, if you're already planning to use a large amount of ion engines once you reach orbit, you're essentially getting those engines for free, and they can form a very useful part of your ascent to Kerbin's orbit. What I learned during making the plane that went to Elu and back twice was that simply powering these engines with a large bank of batteries works very well. It's not as mass efficient as being able to use solar arrays, but Obviously, you can't deploy big external solar panels while still going through the atmosphere because the drag incurred is going to be greater than the thrust you're getting out of the ion engines and you're not going to get very far. After deciding I was going to go ahead with using the ion engines with the battery banks to circularize the orbit, I realized that they really are incredibly weak engines and they did need the extra help from two nuclear engines to give it a little bit of extra thrust. We also needed some additional electricity for the ion engines, so I did include some solar arrays. You'll notice that we took off during the night time. This was so once we were in space, we would have an unobstructed view of Kerbal. We are now in low Kerbin orbit, and at this point we can dispense of the two modules on the side, which comprise the wings and the control surfaces, as well as some extra fuel tanks and engines. We're definitely not going to need any of those things again. To get from Kerbin to Joule, I'm going to use the Kerbin Eve, Kerbin, Kerbin Joule route. I know a lot of people have asked me for a tutorial on how to do this particular route, as well as on how to plan complex sequences of gravity assists in general. And that is definitely a video I want to work on, and I'm hoping to get this done sometime over winter break. So with any luck, that'll be out in the next couple weeks. This route will allow us to get all the way from low Kerbin orbit to Tylo for about 1200 meters per second. You can get this number even a little bit lower if you don't care about how long the route takes, but there is a little bit of inefficiency involved in making sure you get a rendezvous with the next planet in the sequence on the first orbit rather than having to wait 100 years orbiting the Sun. Orbiting the Sun for 100 years with 64 passengers breaks all sorts of things like union rules, passenger safety rules, and your audience's suspension of disbelief. We've gone past our first rendezvous, which was with Eve. Our second rendezvous will be back on Kerbin. And our third rendezvous will be also be on Kerbin. You could even do additional rendezvous with Kerbin if you needed more, more time or more altitude to reach orbit with Joule. The end goal, however, is that our orbit is tangent to a rendezvous with Joule. 
it's very important that it's not at too much of an angle, otherwise your velocity relative to Joule will be so great that you won't be able to capture even with a flyby of Tylo. Our first rendezvous with the Julian moon is with Tylo, which is our destination, but at this point we're going way too fast to capture into an orbit efficiently, so we're just using this rendezvous to capture us in the Julian system. Once in the Julian system, it's extremely easy to get a rendezvous with the moons, especially Lathe and Tylo. In fact, they're so close together that you pretty much have to try to not rendezvous with one of them. After the first rendezvous with Tylo, our second rendezvous is with Lathe, and this puts us on an orbit of Joule that's much closer to reaching an even tangent with Tylo, which means that our relative velocity to Tylo once we rendezvous again is going to be much lower. Thanks to the sequence of gravity assists, once we reach our final rendezvous with Tylo, it only takes a minimal retrograde burn to capture in its orbit. If this injection burn were to be greater, not only would it take more delta V, but at some point there wouldn't be enough energy in the electric charge of the batteries to allow this to be done in one single burn, and since it's a capture burn, it does need to be done all at one time. Once in stable orbit of Tylo, we can take as much time and as many burns at periapsis as we need to reach low Tylo orbit. It's now time for the reason that we all come to Tylo, which is the wonderfully challenging landings. This craft has a couple details about it that makes this landing unusually difficult even for a Tylo landing. The main reason for this is that we're going to be doing a horizontal landing rather than a vertical landing. This will decrease the total delta V used braking, as we can still be moving with some of our horizontal velocity when we land. The difficulty here is that when doing a horizontal landing on Kerbin, we can use wings that use the atmosphere in order to counteract the force of gravity. On Tylo, there is no atmosphere, and as soon as the craft goes horizontal, there'll be no vertical component in our thrust to counteract the force of gravity. I did manage to put the landing gear at a bit of an angle. However, there's still a very significant angle in between where the craft has to be to counteract the force of gravity and where it has to be to be sitting stable on the landing gear. We're therefore going to need to get extremely close to the surface while still moving horizontally and then rotate the nose down immediately before landing, but not too far before landing, or the craft will gain too much vertical velocity and crash into the surface, but not too late that the nose won't be fully rotated down, or else it'll come smashing down when the rear wheels touch and it will crash on the surface. In finding a spot to land this craft, I first found a large flat region, and then found a small, gently rounded convex section within that region that will counter, essentially counteract the effect of gravity during the final touchdown. With all this in place, the final landing proved to be actually rather easier than expected for once, and with a little bit of extra engine burning to help me stabilize the landing immediately after touching down, I was able to turn off the engines at around 90 meters per second, and therefore save about 90 meters per second in delta V of fuel, which is a pretty awesome savings. In honor of the landing, I took Bill out first to take a little bit of a victory lap on top of the craft. After a previous mission, a certain individual that will go unnamed was very critical of the fact that I did not bring all my passengers out onto the surface. So in honor of this particular individual who will go unnamed, I brought every single Kerbal out of the craft and lined them up in a nice, tidy, well, relatively tidy line. Due to the long time period that I had done this mission over, I had completely forgotten about the flag I had used for this mission and was taken entirely by surprise. With the necessary surface festivities complete and this mission not needing any mining, we were ready to go back to Kerbin right away. Because who needs more than an hour of time on the surface after years of traveling here and back? During the takeoff, the landing spot we've chosen again became useful. Normally, taking off after a horizontal landing on Tylo is very difficult due to the high gravity and the fact that there's no atmosphere to help you out. However, the generally smooth terrain in this area, combined with the slope on the side of the crater, gave us a natural ramp to jump off of. Since the engine we're using has not changed and the mass of the craft has changed very significantly due to the draining fuel, the TWR of this craft is now extremely high, and the ascent from Tylo was, after the initial takeoff, really quite easy. However, I've almost forgot about 
the part of this ascent that was tricky, which is to match our inclination to the inclination of the ion stage left in orbit. Since we intend to recover all of our parts, and since we're going to be just about entirely out of fuel once we reach orbit, we're definitely going to need to rendezvous back with the ion stage. And since the orbital velocities around Tylo are quite high, even a very small inclination relative to the stage can result in a very significant normal burn to reach it. The next part of this mission, which was legitimately tricky, was to dock the passenger stage back with the ion stage. Since there's no RCS on either, I'm going to be using the engines on the passenger stage to do this, which um, a Rhino rocket honestly kind of lacks a little bit of subtlety, which is useful when docking, but with a couple tries I was able to get it close. The other thing that I had to pay attention to here was that the stages were aligned. Since this thing's going to have to turn back into a plane before we land, all the modules are going to have to be aligned as well as docked. A direct burn from Tylo orbit all the way directly back to Kerbin can be done, and it's not too outrageous in terms of delta-v used, but we can still save quite a bit again by using some more gravity assists. To do this, we really want to slingshot off of Tylo, which is the absolute best moon in the Joule system to do gravity assists with. So to do this, we're first going to do a rendezvous with Lathe, which will put us on a more advantageous orbit relative to Tylo, and then we're going to use it to slingshot ourselves all the way back to the Kerbin system, mostly for free. One tricky part about returning from Joule to Kerbin is that while it doesn't take that much delta V to reach an intersection with Kerbin, we're going to be going extremely fast relative to Kerbin. With some small crafts, this isn't a problem, since the surface area to volume and therefore to mass ratio is so high, it'll slow down even going through the upper atmosphere of Kerbin. However, with this craft, if we were to go low enough through the atmosphere that it would actually slow us down, the craft would absolutely just fall apart or burn up. I'm not sure which would happen first, but one of those things would definitely happen. Therefore, we're going to do a gravity assist first by Kerbin, which will put us onto a rendezvous with Eve, which will then put us on a rendezvous back with Kerbin. We're essentially using the reverse route that we used to get to Joule to get from Joule back to Kerbin. Once on our final rendezvous with Kerbin, I put the periapsis at Kerbin as low as I dared, and just before reaching the atmosphere, I put a strong spin on the craft, which serves to spread out the shock heating over the whole craft, rather than concentrating it on certain parts of the surface and burning it up. Despite all of my efforts, and despite having done two gravity assists before this to reduce our velocity relative to Kerbin, we were still not in a stable, captured Kerbin orbit after leaving the atmosphere. I therefore needed to do a small retrograde burn to finish this. At this point, however, I was convinced I had done absolutely everything that could be done to save Delta V, and this final burn was in fact necessary. Now that we're in a captured orbit around Kerbin, I fixed our inclination to equatorial and prepared for a long series of many aerobraking passes to slow our orbit down to a low Kerbin orbit. Before we do our final landing on Kerbin, there are some fairly important parts of the space plane that are missing, so we're going to have to go find where we left those in orbit and dock with them. As with the previous docking maneuver, none of these modules have RCS on them, and we're therefore going to be using the cheesy method of using the main engines again, but with, uh, with enough patience and being extremely, extremely careful with the burns, this can be done without too much difficulty. Getting the modules aligned in rotation properly is going to be even more important than it was previously, since not having your wings on straight is, is sort of a big deal. After docking successfully with the first wing, I now encountered the difficulty that my craft was now extremely unbalanced when using any thrust. However, I only needed small burns to rendezvous with the other wing, and by keeping the thrust very low, I was able to counteract the imbalance in the thrust, and the torque that resulted from that using the SAS. With all the parts of the plane that we left with now reattached, we are now ready to land. Now, while the craft was extremely stable and behaved more or less like a normal plane during the ascent, the descent was an entirely different story. 
For some reason, likely the fact that this craft has been taken apart and redocked with itself, it had some very, very strange behaviors. One of these was that sometimes the craft would just decide to roll for no reason whatsoever, and I had to be constantly vigilant to correct this immediately on the descent. If I let the roll get going too far, it would become entirely uncontrollable. There was also some very strange floatiness and very unusual stability issues. Generally, when we say a craft is unstable, it means that the center of drag is either in front of or very close to the center of mass. However, in this case, the center of drag is well behind the center of mass. The instability issues here were different. Firstly, the craft seemed not to want to fly directly straight, but a little bit different than straight, and it would try to crab left and then crab right for no apparent reason whatsoever. The instability issues became even worse at a very low speed, and as a result I had landed this thing considerably faster than I would have liked to. Combine this with the weak wheel brakes on this craft, and there was absolutely no way that it was going to be able to come to a stop on the runway. Since this landing was performed months after the start of this mission, I had completely forgotten about this, and during the first landing attempt I was quite shocked to see myself fly off of the runway and into the ocean. But uh, due to some trusty trans-dimensional time reversal, I went back and remembered to use the parachutes. And with that landing, that brings this mission to a close. We've brought 64 passengers to the surface of Tylo and back. We've recovered all the parts we've launched with, and we haven't used any mining or any refueling. I'd like to thank everyone very much for watching. I've got two more videos I'm working on right now. One of them should be a relatively short video, perhaps a music video, and the other one is the Gravity Assist tutorial that I had mentioned earlier. If you have any input on these or anything you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments below.